Analog Devices is a proud sponsor of Great Minds, Great Ideas. Come meet our great minds at www.analog.com slash community. Welcome back. We're still alive here at the Sands Convention Center at the 2006 Consumer Electronics Show. I'm Brian Fuller, publisher and editor-in-chief of EE Times. And this is a special segment of EE Times TV from the show floor, as you can see. I'm here today with Jeff Beer, president and founder and uh, all-around good guy from BDTI in Berkeley, an expert in, uh, especially in, in uh, DSP teardowns, analysis, research reports, you name it. And we always, when we can, either here or at ESC or Design Automation Conference or wherever, try to track down the elusive Mr. Beer and uh, get his uh, usually thoughtful insights <laughs> on what the hell is going on. And there's so much data overload here, Jeff, that um, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. What do you make of it? Well, I think that uh, CES has just become so huge, it's really overwhelming. And uh, the only way to make sense of it is to focus on something. And in our business, we tend to focus on the semiconductors, and in particular, the processing engines targeting digital signal processing intensive applications like communications and multimedia. Um, one of the really interesting things I see happening in that space is that as the end products, the boxes, are getting to be more and more complex and integrating so much functionality and formats and I.O. interfaces and so on, the box designers are looking to their semiconductor suppliers to provide not just a chip and some programming tool, but a whole truckload of software with that operating system ports and device drivers and reference designs and optimized codecs and so on. And the semiconductor companies, I think, are stepping up to the plate and doing that. And, and in our meetings and demos with the semiconductor companies here this week, we've seen a lot of that. At the same time, though, I think we can see that it's a challenge for them. It's really pushing them into an area very different from what they're traditionally, what they've traditionally been involved in and comfortable with. Is there anyone uh, that comes to mind who is doing a good job of making that transition? Well, we're just beginning our evaluation efforts on the software side. You know, historically, just like chip companies have focused on the processors and the chips, we have as well. We've looked briefly at the, the software that they've provided, but we haven't subjected it to anywhere near the same degree of scrutiny as we would to the processor itself and maybe the development tools. Um, we recently launched a new service we call Solution Certification, and that's specifically aimed at evaluating uh, the quality and performance of the key multimedia software components that these companies are providing with their chips. We're literally just, we've really, literally just started the first engagements, and the first results should be out in about two months. You told me once that um you think that this is going to be the decade of the algorithm. I mean, we've had al algorithms for a long, long time. But in terms of its, its real impact on system design, you think that's it's, it's just now coming into its own? Yeah, um, in Larry Page's uh, keynote, Larry Page from, from Google gave a keynote address yesterday afternoon and uh, really enjoyed it. One of the things he talked about was kind of comparing and contrasting the internet and consumer electronics. In his worldview, the internet has been a hotbed of innovation because of its openness and universal interoperability, um, whereas consumer electronics uh, is a highly constrained environment. If you have any two consumer electronics devices in your house, chances are you can't plug them together. Even something as simple as a camera with a USB interface and a USB thumb drive that you might have in your pocket, you can't make them work together. Um, and his uh, hope for the industry is that the device manufacturers will allow more open interfaces and more interoperability so that uh, there's more flexibility for consumers. But for him, most importantly, I think, so that there's more ability to innovate and a uh, possibility of that innovation coming not only from the, the Sonys of, and Samsungs of the world, but also from a couple of guys in their garage who have a new idea for how something should work. And that relates to your question about algorithms. In the world of digital signal processing uh, technology and applications, which is our focus, 
there's an enormous sort of treasure trove of algorithmic know-how and techniques that have demanded too much processing performance to fit on programmable processors for a long time. So what that meant is the only way you could implement them was if you could afford to do a chip. And so few people could afford to do chips that most of those things didn't get implemented. Now, as processors are becoming powerful enough to do a lot of very sophisticated real-time signal processing on high data rate streams like video, I think we're going to see an acceleration of innovation where guys who either come up with clever new algorithms or dust things off from journal articles or PhD dissertations that are 20 years old say, oh, you know what, I can now implement this algorithm on an off-the-shelf processor that's a $20 or $30 or even maybe a $10 processor and maybe bring some important new capability to users. Well, uh, that's certainly food for thought going forward. Are you going to take a couple of days off after this uh, chaos? I, I'd like to. I think I need about a week off to get the ringing out of my ears. Amen. Jeff Beer from BDTI, thanks for stopping by. Thanks a lot, Brian. I'm Brian Fuller, and you've been watching EE Times TV.